It's a declaration of war, was the response from the Boer Afrikaner Volksrand, a group that represents Afrikaans-speaking farmers in response to South African President Jacob Zuma's pledge to expropriate land and businesses from white owners and hand it over to blacks. The scandal-plagued president, who has been in office since 2009, is leader of the African National Congress, a party who recently suffered the worst losses at the polls since the end of apartheid in 1994, with the loss of Johannesburg, Pretoria, and the coastal city of Port Elizabeth to the moderate Democratic Alliance Party, which already held Cape Town. Along with the ANC, the Economic Freedom Fighters, basically a black nationalist party with Marxist leanings, and is the third largest party in the parliament, is also demanding that white land and businesses be seized. Its leader, Julius Melema, who was expelled from the ANC, has urged black South Africans to take the land from white invaders, or what he calls Dutch thugs. In parliament, he explained that his party wanted to unite black people in South Africa to expropriate white land without compensation. As recently as November 2016, he has magnanimously stated that we are not calling for the slaughter of white people, at least for now. As Melima spurs on racial animosity and incites calls for genocide, the Boer Afrikaner Volksrand's chairman, Andreas Breitenbach, has stated that whites are ready to fight back. But he has also called for immediate and urgent mediation between groups representing whites and the government. But he does warn that if the government begins to expropriate land, it will lead to a race war. The rising racial tensions between black and white come on top of a rising populist movement that is characterized by deep resentment and xenophobia by South African blacks toward other sub-Saharan immigrants. Tensions broke out in late February 2017 when police had to fire rubber bullets, tear gas, and water cannon to disperse rival angry mobs of protesters and foreigners, both groups armed with bricks, knives, and sticks. And as the South African president and much of his government fans the flames of racial animosity and white hate for their own gain, the current situation is also being played out to a backdrop of a country that is becoming increasingly lawless. Since the end of apartheid, millions of blacks have been educated and have risen out of poverty. But South Africa has been dubbed the rape capital of the world by Interpol, with a staggering one in three South African men admitting to rape. Government corruption is an endemic problem, and HIV AIDS rates are among the highest in the world, with life expectancy in South Africa since 1994 plummeting. In fact, even among the harshest critics of apartheid and racial oppression, there is an acknowledgement that in many ways the Rainbow Nation under African National Congress and South African Communist Party rule is heading downhill fast. But it is crime and violent crime, and what the police minister Hathi Naleko calls a prevalent culture of violence that permeates the blood-soaked streets of South Africa, which saw in 2016 its murder rate increase by a whopping 4.9% year-on-year, with more than 50 people murdered every day, and a bumbling and incompetent police force that lends to a shockingly low conviction rate of only 10% of those murders. Whether right or wrong, it was whites that built the cities and the nation of South Africa. And now that they have handed it over to the black majority, their continued existence in the country looks precarious. Everyone in South Africa, regardless of color, will say that white people are still riding high. I've had discussions with South Africans myself. They run the economy, they have a disproportionate amount of influence in politics and the media. But not all of them. There is an increasing number of whites that are now living in extreme deprivation in white squalor camps or shanty towns built after the fall of apartheid. And with affirmative action that favors blacks and coloreds, it's getting harder and harder for many whites, especially working class whites, to find work. And even more sinister is the relentless murder of white commercial farmers that has exploded since the end of apartheid. And to call it simply murder is to do an injustice to the victims. According to Genocide Watch, 4,000 farmers have been brutally tortured and then murdered, with scores of others maimed and raped. 
And this is President of South Africa, Jacob Zuma, singing a variation of Shoot the Boar or Shoot the White Farmer in early 2012 during a celebration by the African National Congress. And having all of this stacked against them and given the penchant for grotesque violence and genocide instigated by not only security services, but average citizens in African countries, there has now been calls for whites to be allowed the right to return to Europe. White South Africans are asking the European Union to give them the right to return home after claims they are facing ethnic cleansing. And given the statements by Julius Melema, the leader of the EFF, that whites will be slaughtered unless they give up all of the land in South Africa, and this sentiment being echoed by President Zuma in terms of land redistribution, the plight of whites in Africa does indeed, over the long term, look bleak. And given the collaborative media silence that attends the ongoing disintegration of post-apartheid South Africa, it is astounding that the vaunted and hopelessly leftist legacy media, including the BBC, is now openly asking if white people have a future in Africa. And should land confiscation go ahead, a very clear and predictable future for South Africa can be forecasted. Its economic fate will be reminiscent to that of its neighbor Zimbabwe, where shortly after a similar confiscation of white land, turned the country from the breadbasket of Africa to a basket case as food production plummeted and the economy disintegrated into a hyperinflationary vortex. And it took Zimbabwe 15 years to admit their mistake and now are begging white farmers to return. Given the track record of general failure in post-colonial Africa and the very clear and present example of Zimbabwe, the fact that, according to foreign policy, there is not a single successful black nation anywhere on earth should give the leaders of South Africa pause. Post-apartheid, post-Mandela South Africa has a choice. It can either use the talent and knowledge of all of its people to try and build a better society for everybody, or it can expropriate land and businesses of its white minority and fracture into racial and tribal war and join the rest of sub-Saharan Africa as its newest failed state. Ironically, many of which are now being recolonized by an assertive China. <laughs> Thanks for watching. If you like this video, please consider subscribing. Also, find me on the usual social media and check out the website blackvisionspeaks.com for more interesting information like this. <laughs>